In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins if necessary. Therefore, with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege and opportunity to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us concerning these things and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 10, verse 38. Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. Well, actually, uh, let's move on to 1040 is where we really left off. Matthew chapter 10, verse 40. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. This is a pretty simple passage, and it just says this. Whoever receives the message of the gospel, when they receive the message, they receive Christ. And when they receive Christ, they receive God the Father. So when you believe in Christ, he is the mediator. That's the only way you can have salvation is faith alone in Christ alone. And that's the... Uh, the basic point of that verse. 1041, whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. So there is reward related to listening to the word of God from the communicator. The prophets in the Old Testament and uh, those who would, they would think were prophets then, when they would receive the message from them, if it was a correct message, they would receive the reward of a prophet because they would receive the word of God. The word of God in itself is a reward, but also they receive eternal rewards for learning the word of God. So whoever receives a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. Whoever receives a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. Who is a righteous person and who receives uh, the uh, name of a righteous person? Well, a righteous person is someone who has believed in Christ and also uh, the fact whoever receives a righteous person also deals with Jesus Christ who had perfect righteousness. So whoever receives a righteous person in the name, whoever receives Jesus Christ, the righteous man, in the name of a righteous person, someone who has believed in Jesus Christ, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ is imputed righteousness. So whoever, so whoever receives a righteous person, Jesus Christ, in the name of a righteous person, a believer who communicates the gospel to someone else, they will receive a righteous person's reward. That reward is uh, the uh, righteousness of God, of course, that all of us receive when we believe in Christ. Therefore, we have eternal security. This is also based on the same principle that we found in the fact that if you receive the word of God from a communicator of doctrine, you receive reward. Then in 1042, and whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones... Little ones is a reference to the disciples. They are being trained so that they might go out as apostles and uh, win over a lot of souls for Christ. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, disciples, in the name of a disciple, I tell you the truth, he will not lose his reward. Giving a cup of cold water to the communicator of the gospel and or doctrine indicates positive volition. It indicates uh, you like it and you want it. And if you appreciate the message, then you reciprocate. The communicator of the message gives you the message. You reciprocate by giving them something that uh, they need in life, such as a cold cup of water, something that was... Uh, a little more rare back then than it is today. We have refrigeration systems in which we can have ice water when we want it. But back then, it was a little bit hard to come by a cold cup of water. So anyone who would give them a cold cup of water would receive a reward, not because of their actions, but because their actions demonstrated a a great mental attitude, a mental attitude that said, hey, I like the message I'm receiving, 
Therefore, I will give these people communicating this message a cold cup of water. It's the principle of reciprocation. And if you did not appreciate the message, then you will uh, stomp, stomp them away. You won't offer them a cold cup of water. If anything, you'll offer them some hot criticism. That's usually the way it goes. So when you accept doctrine and your eyes light up when doctrine's being taught, it is just as if you are giving a cup of fresh, cold water to the communicator of doctrine. And it's just an analogy saying, look, if you appreciate the message, uh, you will uh, support those who give it. Then we have the ministry of the king. And this begins in chapter 11. Now chapter 10 was a parenthetical insert. You know what a parenthesis is? Especially if you're in school right now, they'll teach you all about this. And uh, some book might have a, a long subject and then in parentheses uh, say something like an aside. And the book might talk about how popular someone is and then as an aside, uh, give the reason why and talk about how someone else helped them in that manner. Well, this is a parenthesis in which uh, chapter 10, the whole chapter is a parenthesis. And uh, what uh, Christ is doing after he has lambasted his disciples for so long, now he's saying, look, I didn't do this all on my own, even though he is the son of God. He says, look, I have helpers. I have people who responded to my message and people who were willing to uh, spread my message as well. And uh, that, that whole parenthesis was for the disciples. A, type, a kind of a compliment, really, that our Lord spent so much time pointing out the disciples. So this is a parenthetical insert of his briefing to the disciples to demonstrate for us the principle that Jesus Christ didn't do all the work himself. And for any communicator of the Word of God, they never do all the work themselves. There are people with spiritual gifts in the congregation, and they too help out in their own way. And you see, if the church ever got large enough, I wouldn't have time to go around and visit all the sick and go to the hospitals. Well, the Lord has given each, each one, by means of God the Holy Spirit, a spiritual gift, such as the gift of helps. And a lot of women have this gift in which they are function very well when they go to hospitals in order to comfort the sick, comfort those who may be dying. Maybe they'll uh, sit around the bedside and uh, read from the Psalms or, or do something else that would be comforting to the one who is going through their own death-shadowed valley. And that would be the gift of helps. Now, the pastor teacher can go if he, would, uh, if he would like and has the time, but the fact is the pastor teacher must spend his time studying and teaching, studying and teaching, and that's his job, and all of you have jobs. And today, what most people in a lot of churches want to do is give the whole shebang to the pastor and say, the pastor must also have the gift of helps and go to the hospital, even though he doesn't have time and needs to be studying. And they should be able to handle it after they've heard doctrine in any way. And they'll want him to do all sorts of things. And they'll say, Pastor, arrange some sort of program. Well, you don't need a program. What you need is the Word of God. Now, if you want to do something outside of these church walls, that's perfectly your business. And I hang out with people outside of church and enjoy their company, and, but it's not part of a church function. And, and once you start uh, mixing those together and say, we need to have a church function, we need to do this and that in order to bring people in, well, you're using gimmicks. And we'll see how gimmicks don't work and how our Lord prohibited the disciples from ever, ever using gimmicks. So when Jesus had finished briefing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach. This is chapter 11, verse 1. When Jesus had finished briefing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Now why does he say teach and preach? Why didn't he just say teach? Or why didn't he just say preach? Well, the two uh, relate to the same gift. Now, our Lord was the Lord Jesus Christ. Of course, he had the gift to communicate why he was here. But today, we have gift of pastor-teacher. And what this is saying to the disciples who will become apostles and to every pastor-teacher down the road, it's saying, look, you, get, you have two mandates. They're, they're both related, but number one, teach. 
Now, when you teach, what you do is uh, like I'm doing. Go verse by verse, explain it, interpret it, compare Scripture with Scripture, reveal it from the time in which it was written. Use isagogics. Go back into the Greek when necessary, which it always is necessary, and see what it says, and then reveal it. Well, that's teaching. That's teaching. What is preaching? Well, that's the personality of the pastor, really. And the preaching has to do with uh, their ability to communicate. It's a gift that has been given to every communicator of the Word of God at the point of their salvation. Preaching means they use voice inflection. When they see eyes glaze over, they know that they're not doing their job, so they get a little tough. And they might shout in order to wake people up. So teach is on the one hand. Teach would be revealing the Word of God. Preach! Well, you know, uh, when uh, people, especially if you've been to a Baptist church or a Pentecostal or whatever, when they say that the man is preaching, what is he doing? He's getting fired up. He's, he's, getting, he's not being somber the whole time, just going verse by verse like the Catholics do. And the Catholics follow a bunch of uh, ritual, and when the priest stands up, they all sound about the same. And they speak Latin, of course. I've seen it on television. I don't know Latin. But it sounds about like this. And then they usually have a high-pitched voice because they like little boys. That's, well, that's, I'm sorry about that comment. But uh, a lot of them, it's true for them because uh, they don't allow them to marry. And a lot of people go into the priesthood who are weird. And so they get up. And they go through all of those rituals. Well, that's not the way it's supposed to be done. It's supposed to be preached. And that's why when pastors get fired up at most local churches, they'll say, preach it, brother. And everybody out there will say, preach it, brother. Well, on the one hand, you have to preach it. And on the other hand, you have to teach it. And there must be a balance. You can't always preach. At some of the Pentecostal churches, that's what they do. They just get up and they just preach and shout and get everybody fired up over nothing. And they're not even teaching anything of value, but they get them fired up emotionally. Well, they've forsaken the teaching part because they don't know what to teach. So you have to balance it out as a pastor. You, on the one hand, you have to teach what it says. On the other hand, you have to motivate with preaching. And there's a fine balance there. And usually God the Holy Spirit, if they're filled with God the Holy Spirit, will reveal it to them when things need to be preached and when things need to be teached. Usually it's a combination of both. So when Jesus had finished briefing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach, meaning that uh, he wasn't always soft. When he had to preach, he preached, and he would look at those religious people and say, you're going to hell unless you believe in me, and make it very clear. So they ended up hating him very much. And most of the time they hated him for, for the preaching. The teaching part, well, he taught all the time. And the Pharisees and the scribes and all the hypocrites, they taught all the time. They would go into the synagogues and just teach. And they would teach from the Old Testament and say, this means, and usually it would be very boring. Usually it was a time where people would get off of work and they would go to the synagogue because they thought it was the thing to do. And they would sit down uh, thinking, well, this is my time to relax because uh, I've been working so hard. So I'm going to relax and listen to this numbskull get up and just drone on and on so I can relax for an hour and think about other, th other things. But our Lord would come in and preach it. And this was a contrast to the people in the synagogues. It was a contrast to uh, those uh, religious leaders. It was something new, and most people were shocked by it. They were shocked by the preaching, of course. And then in 11.2, now when John, that is John the baptizer, now when John heard in prison, now this was a prison called uh, Mac uh, Macedus, M-A-C-C-E-D-D-U-S. There's still some questions uh, surrounding that in history. It's not really important for us to know which prison, but uh, uh, most people from history uh, think it's a prison, prison named M-A-C-C-E-D-D-U-S. And it's a prison called uh, Amacadus. It was a tall, isolated castle on a high cliff on the other side of the Dead Sea. So he was across the sea, and he heard about our Lord Jesus Christ in the prison. 
People would probably come to him who were his students, John the Baptizer's students, and they would come to him and say, look, I've been listening to this fellow named Jesus Christ and... Uh, you know, he has a, uh, he has a lot of uh, gifts of healing and all of these things, and he teaches with authority. So they would come up all the time and ask him and say, Is he the Messiah, John? Because uh, they were his students, and they would say, John the baptizer, is this man the Messiah? And so finally, uh, well, he had to make sure himself, which is normal. He wasn't going to accept it right off. Well, even though he'd already believed in Christ, remember that, but he, he had been getting a lot of questions from his disciples who had fallen into legalism. So he had to make it clear that he definitely was the Messiah. He already accepted it, but he got so many questions while he was sitting there in jail, he finally came to say, all right, what you need to do is go back and ask him if he is the Messiah. Because if he would have just said, yes, he is, they may not have believed him. So he says, go back. Go back to Jesus and ask him personally, is he the Messiah that is to come? And that would uh, give Jesus Christ the opportunity to make it very clear to them. So this is what they said in 11.3. Are you the Messiah or should we wait for another? That's what John the Baptist told all of his students to go and ask our Lord. Well, he knew the answer. He just wanted them to see it face to face with our Lord. So Jesus gave them this answer. Go tell John what you hear and see. This was something John already knew about, but uh, they were the disciples of John, which means the students of John, and John wanted them to uh, believe in Christ as well. So he, he gives them actually something from prophecy, something that uh, Isaiah had prophesied something that they knew would occur. Go tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The deaf hear. The dead are raised. And the poor have gospel. The gospel proclaimed to them. And so um, this is what he told them to go do. And when they went back with this message, he would just go back into Isaiah. And he would show it to them and say, look, he is the Messiah because right here in Isaiah it says he's going to make the deaf uh, hear. He's going to make the blind see. He's going to do all of these miraculous things. That indicates that he's the Messiah. This hasn't happened here for thousands of years. This is why it's happening. He's the Messiah. So they would go back with this message and then uh, John the baptizer would explain it to him and say, yes, he's the Messiah. Look, he's getting it straight from the Old Testament. So he wanted them to see it at face value right from Scripture. He wanted them to look right at Scripture instead of just relying on his word. They wanted them to look at the word of God and say, you know what? That is what it says. That is what was prophesied. So he must be the Son of God. And that's exactly the way John the baptizer framed it, by sending them to the Lord. Now in 11.6 it says, uh, whoever does not uh, fall away, something like that in your translation. I looked today at some of the translations to see uh, uh, what was there. And it said, uh, whoever does not fall away on account of me. Now your translation might not say that, but I saw a few that did say that. But, it, uh, but why were they falling away? And you see, before, uh, they, had, uh, they had used that same Greek word that was used there, and they translated it amazed. And now, when they use it, they translate it a fall away on account of me. This has to do with being shocked again. Whoever is not shocked by me is blessed. And, of course, they put blessed first and say, blessed is the one who does not fall away on account of me. Well, why would they fall away on account of him? The reason is very simple. They were shocked by his message. And they fall away not on the account of the apostles and the disciples who will come out and teach. You see, they're going to come out and they're going to be gung-ho just like their teacher was, Jesus Christ. And they're going to come out in the same manner that he did and said, you're all going to hell unless you believe in Christ and insult a lot of people. And so uh, this is part of it. Whoever is not shocked on account of me. That means they were shocked by the Lord. They're going to be shocked by the disciples as well. So many were shocked by Christ due to his inculcation of religion in the area. 
not his, but due to the inculcation of religion over the uh, past hundreds of years. These people were very religious. And religious people are shocked by grace. They were shocked by our Lord. And they were so shocked by his message that they all the time tried to accuse him of being a drunkard, a glutton, and they tried to accuse him of hanging out with prostitutes and being all of these nefarious types of things, but he wasn't, he was perfect. And they were shocked by his message. So whoever is not shocked, that is, they have enough humility to, to at least look at it objectively. You see, uh, there, you see uh, it would be natural for somebody not to accept it at face value. I mean, uh, somebody comes to the earth for the first time ever and says, I am the Son of God, believe in me. Well, it, it would be natural to have a bit of skepticism. You might be a little stupid if you didn't. And so they would analyze these things and look at them. But uh, when they would hear something, they would be so, so shocked in their emotions that they wouldn't hear the message. And, what they, and, and our Lord did it on purpose because he knew that the uh, people who would be so shocked didn't care anyway. They, you see, when you get shocked by things, you're thinking about yourself all the time and you're being hypersensitive. And that's a point of doctrine we'll study in the future. We haven't studied it in detail now. But they would get hypersensitive concerning themselves. And I'm not talking about anyone here. I'm just giving you what the Scripture has to say about these religious people. They got hypersensitive. And they were shocked. And they took it personal. And they said, no way this man's going to talk to me that way. Instead of being objective, they became subjective. And that's something that's even been developed in psychology, but developed by the Word of God a long time before psychology developed it. And to be objective says you, instead of reacting, instead of being shocked, you sit back and you think about what Jesus had to say. And you say, well, he said, I'm going to hell. He said, believe in me. He said, I was a whitewashed tomb. And instead of reacting to it and saying, Nobody's ever going to talk to me that way. They should have said, maybe I am a whitewashed tomb. Maybe I am all those things Jesus said I was, and they were. But they were a, too, a, a bit too arrogant to see it. And that's why he shocked them, to shock them out of it, so that they could see themselves as they really were. It was as if he held up a mirror to them for the first time, and this mirror was reality. And when they looked in the mirror, they were shocked because they saw themselves as depraved. And all of us are depraved. Every one of us. And a lot of times, now I wasn't shocked when I believed in Christ. I was only five, but I knew I needed a Savior. But a lot of times, people who have lived to be 40, 50, 60 years old, never believed in Christ, suddenly receive the message, and they might get a little shocked to realize that it's not good enough that they were a good family man. It's not good enough that they were faithful to their wife. It's not good enough that they were great fathers, and they probably were, but it's not good enough. And when they hear it's not good enough, they take it personally and say, but I am a good man. God's going to accept me. I've been good my whole life. Well, Jesus was having to shock this out of them. And he, he was looking at a lot of moral people. I mean, these people would never cheat on their wives only in their minds, you see, and we studied that earlier, but they would never do it overtly, and they would uh, never uh, 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 forsake their children and always provide for their children and be just really good family people and really good what we would consider wholesome people, and they were. And here's our Lord shocking them, getting up and saying, you're sinners and you're going to hell. It doesn't matter how good you think you are. You're not good enough. And he would say, I am your Savior. And they would all react to that instead of think about it. So this is a matter of objectivity. Those who had enough sense to, to have enough humility and say, I'll uh, mull this over in my mind. They didn't accept it right off, but they said to themselves, I'll go home and I'll think about this tonight. And then usually they would, come, they would either come to two different conclusions. Either one, yeah, the man's right, and I believe in him, or two, now nah, the man's wrong. But at least they were objective. And if you're subjective, you hear it and react right off and run out the door screaming, Ah! He called me these things. But well, he did it for a reason. 
So whoever is not shocked by me is blessed. That is the corrected translation. And whoever does not fall away, well, that's all right if you understand why they're falling away. They're falling away because they're shocked. They're falling away on account of our Lord, not on account of the communicators, but on account of the Lord. So if you're not shocked by it and you have enough objectivity to say to at least mull it over in your mind, well, there's a blessing in that, especially if you accept it. Then in 11.7, while they were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd. Remember, this is a religious crowd. These people are highly religious. While they were going away, Jesus began to speak to the religious crowd about John. You see, uh, John's disciples had come up, which was all part of God's plan, and asked our Lord, are you the Messiah who is to come? And not only, uh, well, what made it so interesting is the fact that uh, none of those religious people had the thought that he was the Messiah. Now there is John the baptizer out in the desert earlier who paved the way. And they had heard about these things from John the baptizer. And after hearing about these things, and they knew who John the baptizer was, and when they saw the students of John the baptizer come up and say, is this really the Messiah who was to come? And then our Lord gives them that message. Guess what? It wasn't just the, the John's disciples that heard it. It was the religious crowd. And they had a lot to uh, maul over or mull over in their mind. They had a lot to think about. And this is how it was presented. So while they were going away, that's John's disciples. They heard what they needed to hear, hear and they went on back to uh, the prison to inform uh, John of all that had happened. Jesus began to speak to the religious crowd. They saw all of that just occur, and we have to put it in that context that they knew this has just happened, and they just saw our Lord proclaim himself the Messiah by using Old Testament scripture. So they're still, they're still a bit stunned, because who in the world would claim to be the Messiah? And then he talks about John. You see, they're all thinking about him right now, and they're all mad at our Lord right now. And they're all saying to themselves in their own minds, this man says he's the Messiah He's not the Messiah. So then what he does is he starts to talk about someone else. He had been talking about himself, and now he talks about John. Because guess what? All these religious people uh, at this point, by this time, thought at least that John the baptizer was a prophet. They at least thought that much about him. And so, uh, what did you uh, go out to see John? What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? So they had just uh, heard John's students come up to him and ask him a question. And then the Lord turns around and asks them, the religious people, a question. What would you go out in the wilderness to see? A lot of them had been out in the wilderness. A lot of them had witnessed the baptism of our Lord Jesus Christ and saw those miracles, yet they still didn't uh, come to believe. So he says to them, what would you go out in the wilderness to see? 11.8. What did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothes? Those who wear soft clothes are in the homes of castles. And then in 11.9, But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, even more than a prophet. And the reason why he brings this up, the fact that John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer, correctly stated. Why did he say even more than a prophet? He was trying to make a point to them, because they were always in their minds, when they saw John the Baptizer, they kept thinking, what is his position? What is his office? Is he a prophet? Is he uh, someone who holds the office of prophecy? And they constantly struggled with that. Is he a prophet or is he demon-possessed? That's what they would do. He's either a prophet or demon-possessed, and that's how they thought about it in their minds. But then our Lord comes along and says, He's more than a prophet! And yet, the reason why our Lord says this is because He's trying to inculcate to the religious crowd something they didn't understand, that the office is not important. You see, uh, they, they, would have, they would hold titles. 
the Sanhedrin who were there had titles. And, and some of them would be priest and etc. And they would hold a title in culture. And the Pharisees would hold titles. And the man who had memorized all the Old Testament would be bestowed upon him a certain title that man would praise. And what our Lord is saying, titles are meaningless. You keep wondering if he's a prophet. He's more than a prophet. In other words, why didn't you listen to the message? He had a message. You're too busy worrying about whether he was a prophet or not. Why didn't you listen to the message? You had your eyes focused on the man and not the message. You had your eyes focused on John and not the message. And that's what he's telling them. Get your eyes off people and start listening. Open up your ears and listen to what the man had to say. And if you had heard what he had to say, you would have known that he was more than a prophet. So this title, and today people use titles and say, I am a pastor. And some they use that title to hold some sway and to um, make people think that they're holier than everyone else. And it's not true. Pastors have old sin natures. Pastors sin, I sin, and they sin all around here. But they, try, they have a, funny, a phony front. And if they are a reverend... They try to speak like one. They try to act like one. They try to follow what society says a pastor should act like. But it's not the man. And that's because everyone around this area and around the country is focused on the man, just as these religious people were. And they focused on the man and said, oh, he couldn't uh, be that great of a person because he did this and that. Or because he did this and the other. Focused on the man. Why focus on the man? Listen to the message. The message is what's important. And this is what we get out of this. And this is why he brings it up. Did you go out to see a prophet? Yes, even more than a prophet. In other words, forget the titles and listen to the message. 11.10 This is the one about whom it stands written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare, prepare your way before you. This is the one about whom it stands written. Now, if you think about this just for a moment, you might glean something out of it. But if not, it's okay. I'm going to tell you what it says and what it means. This is the one about whom it stands written. This means that the word makes the man. It had been written about John in the past. The Word makes the man. And if you know the Word, that makes you who you are. The Word makes the man. But the man doesn't make the Word. And when I stand up here, I'm not doing, as a lot of pastors do, and create the Word. And you say, but my uh, Bible doesn't say it in quite that way. Well, I'm going straight from the original languages. And I have all the notes that are available that can tell you why uh, certain things needed to be translated this way. You see, when they wrote your Bible, they had a whole bunch of different people writing it. And some people got it right, and that's where we get a lot of good translations because they were great scholars. And other people were a little lax in it, a little lazy, and they didn't do enough study, and they would get things wrong. And that's why in your NIV, in one place, we have the word metanoieo, and they translate it change of mind. But in another place, they have the word metanoieto, and they translate it repentance. Well, it's a different translator. You don't have the same one. And if you look at your English Bible as the infallible word of God, it's not. It's not. Now, they're getting pretty close lately, a lot, more, a lot closer than the King James. But I'm telling you that uh, you must know exegesis, you must know Greek. I don't personally, but I knew someone who did. And I can uh, go back and I can pull up every reason why this was gnomic present or whatever and give it to you, and you could look it up on your own and see that it's right. I guarantee you it's right. I'm not giving you something that's incorrect and you say, my Bible doesn't say that. He's making it up for his own benefit. No! I would never do anything that stupid. So this is the one about whom it stands written. The Word makes the man. But the man doesn't make the Word and that's the point. Just like the fact that uh, uh, man makes money but money doesn't make the man. And a lot of you ladies, and men included, sometimes get uh, sucked away with 
uh, the idea of meeting someone with a lot of money. I wish I were with so-and-so. They're rich. They could provide this and this and this. But just the fact that they made money doesn't make them a great person. They might, be, they might beat you to death every night, and you'd wish you went back to your old uh, poverty-stricken life with someone who was kind to you. So don't look for money as a solution, not in people especially, because uh, uh, wealthy people have sin natures, and just because they've made a lot of money makes them no different than you. Now that doesn't mean you should be envious and say tax the rich because uh, they've made it. No, don't do. Don't think like that. That is a. That means that uh, you don't understand capitalism and the fact that uh, wealthy people create jobs. Have you ever been employed by a poor man? I mean, if he's really poor, he can't provide you a job. Who provides the jobs? Rich people. So every time government gets up and says through propaganda and says, "Look, you vote for me, and we will soak the rich." How's that going to help you? They'll soak the rich. They'll still be rich, and they'll just uh, eliminate your jobs. And they'll say, well, we can't afford you anymore. Bye-bye. And they hold on to their money, and that's the way it works. But that's just a common sense of capitalism, and that's part of divine establishment. So it's the word that makes the man, back to the point, but the man doesn't make the word. And so they had their eyes on the man instead of the message. And so he had to go back in Scripture and say, this is what you came to see, a man who knew the Word, a man who had a destiny to know the Word and give it to you. Because it, was, it stands written as prophecy. Look, I'm sending my messenger, John the baptizer, ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Prepare the way because he would give the gospel and also teach them rebound after they had believed. And we studied all of that. 1111, I tell you the truth, among those born of women, no one is greater than John the baptizer. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he is. I tell you the truth, among those born of women, no one is greater than John the baptizer. He's making a point to them saying, uh, you've always been criticizing the man, but he's a great man. But then he turns it right around and says something pertaining to grace. Yet, the one who is least, least here is a reference to maximum grace orientation. When you have grace orientation, you consider yourself least. Do you know we don't even take another breath apart from the will of God? And when we understand that, we become small, least. And we don't run around thinking that because of my goodness, I breathe. You run around thinking, because of God's goodness, I breathe. Because of His grace, you breathe. So in your own eyes, you become least and not great. Because you understand grace. You understand the fact you don't even breathe apart from God. Least means maximum, grace orientation. Arrogance and grace are antithetical. It's uh, that sword concept again. If, you, if, if someone is arrogant and finds someone who has grace, there is a conflict. The arrogant person always wants to bully the grace-oriented person because they know where they stand. They are least. It doesn't mean they, ha they feel sorry for themselves. It simply means that they know who they are because of the grace of God, like the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul never had an inferiority complex, but what did he say? He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. And what was he? The greatest apostle ever. But he knew from whence it came. And he didn't run around saying, I'm the greatest apostle ever, and it's because of me and my great studies. No. He said, I am what I am by the grace of God. So that's least. And a lot of people said, that, that apostle Paul guy, he, he talks like somebody who thinks he knows everything. Well, he's a communicator of doctrine. He's supposed to teach it with authority. But they would uh, nitpick him. And we'll see this when we get into First and Second Corinthians. And first they say he's too tough. And then after that they say, oh, he's too soft. He writes to us these letters and they're all tough. Yet when he gets in person, he's just a little short, mealy mouth. And Apostle Paul, and from what I know, it was a short, bald-headed man. But we don't know that for sure. That's just part of the way history conjectures. And, uh, and the thing is, well, he didn't... Uh, 
Well, he was criticized either way. And believe it or not, I'm not comparing myself with the Apostle Paul. I'm nowhere close. No, and never will be close. But uh, someone uh, wrote me an email and said, your messages are soft. You keep teaching like that and your whole congregation is going to run over you. I had to laugh. <laughs> I had to laugh at that because, you know. But you see, it's a different of opinion because uh, uh, one person said, you're too soft. Another person says, you're too harsh. Well, get your eyes off the man and get your eyes on the message is the principle. Uh, but uh, the same thing happened with the Apostle Paul. And he would write letters and they'd say, oh, you're real tough and your letter's hot shot. But when you get face to face with us, you're a real mealy mouth, soft person. And so he wrote back and said, I'll prove to you I'm no soft person when I get face to face with you. And he most certainly did. And that wasn't recorded because it, it, from all indications, the Apostle Paul went out of fellowship and was so angry, he uh, ripped them apart. And then they all scattered to the breeze. And then he felt bad, and he was sorry he'd done it. But he, was, he, got, he got fired up and said, he got sick of the criticism and just went and tore the heck out of them. And that is not been, that's not part of Scripture now. And this is found in 2 Corinthians because he, he felt so bad about what he had done, he started writing a soft letter. And then Titus went in and straightened it all out anyway, and he was another tough guy. That's what the Corinthians needed. They were so messed up. They needed somebody who would uh, tell them like it was. So he talks about John the baptizer and makes it clear it's the message, not the man. Then in 11.12, From the days of John the baptizer until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. Now this is a reference to the fact that people can become violent toward those who are grace-oriented. And it often happens. They despise grace orientation because it doesn't line up with their traditional philosophy and their traditional arrogance. And when these grace-oriented people do not pay homage to mere men and they do not become respecters of mere men, such as the Pharisees, it's like the Pharisees would say, I'm a Pharisee, respect me. The grace-oriented person would say, you are, but what you are by the grace of God, just as I am, I respect you no more than anyone else. You're just a man. You're a mere man. And that when they stopped respecting mere man, knowing that God's grace is what makes everyone who they are, well, they hated the grace-oriented. They wouldn't follow tradition. And uh, one time I was uh, telling someone uh, a long time ago when I was uh, 20 or 18, uh, maybe a late teenager, and I said, uh, and they were, I don't know what they were, but they said, who do you listen to? We had been talking about Christianity. And this was online, by the way. I went into one of those uh, Christian chat rooms to see what was going on there. And uh, this guy was talking to me, and uh, he was, said, what do you believe? And I gave him a, a, a list. Basically, most of it was the, the salvation part because I wanted him to know it too. And then he said, well, who's your pastor? Where are you getting this? So I sent him to the, uh, the website, which was uh, right then, R.B. Theme Jr. website. It still is today. And he went there and he read the doctrinal statement and all, and he said, that doesn't follow tradition. That's not part of tradition. And I said, well, he doesn't teach tradition. He teaches the Word of God. But he was all worried about, he was a Methodist, I come to find out, and he was worried about the tradition of the church. Well, tradition isn't part of it. And we'll see later in other books of the Bible where a pastor must actually separate himself from tr tradition, a good one, that is. Most of them around here still follow tradition. The way it's always been done is the way they're going to do it, and they don't know any better, but it's because they don't want to know any better. And if they do know better, I've known pastors who've known better, but say, nah, I'd rather have the money and all of the praise from people. Well, surely they already have their reward. They got their little manna, and they got praise from a bunch of ignorant people. And they already have their reward because they're not going to get one in heaven because they failed. And it's always a temptation to want to see big crowds, not for me, really, uh, but for uh, uh, most pastors. That's what they want. That's their livelihood. But I look at it like this. 
the grace of God put me here, the grace of God will keep me here. And if the grace of God doesn't want me to be here, the grace of God will send me somewhere else, or the grace of God will give me a job somewhere else. And just have a relaxed mental attitude about it, as he told the disciples to have. So don't even bother taking extra clothes. Don't even bother taking your wallet. Don't take any money. Just go from town to town. People will provide for you. In other words, I'll provide for you, and you'll be all right. And that's how faith rests. And if a pastor doesn't have faith rest, how is his congregation going to have faith rest? And if they're always standing up begging for money, not having faith rest and saying, we need to build this and you must uh, give all your money and then call you up and dun you and say, well, we need to do this. Can you uh, help me out here? Well, if they don't have faith rest, neither is the congregation. And it's a sad fact. And it's the reason why our country is suffering. There is no other reason why our country should be suffering right now. We have a predominance of believers in this country, especially in the South. No reason why we should be under any type of punishment. I mean, we should still be functioning. We are still blessed, and that's part of the reason. is because there's so many believers, and what the righteousness of God approves, He blesses. So a lot of people have the righteousness of God in spite of themselves. And so the country keeps going, being blessed. But there comes a point when collectively, if everybody starts to say, forget the word of God, they become like the Laodiceans. And we'll study them in Revelation. Remember the Laodiceans, they became very wealthy. And the Laodiceans had a problem with water. They would receive hot water from the springs, but by the time it was funneled to their city, it got lukewarm. And then they received cold water from the mountains, but by the time that water got to the city, it had been heated by the sun, and it got lukewarm. So they didn't have hot and cold water, just lukewarm. And when they would drink it, they would get sick and vomit. And so our Lord made an analogy and said, Look, you're so wealthy, and they were. They became very wealthy because at first, they started out hot for the word. Then they got lukewarm. Lukewarm is a believer. They're, they're saved, but they don't care for the word of God. And he said, I would rather you be hot or cold. What's cold? Unbeliever. And he's telling them, I'd rather you be an unbeliever than a believer out of fellowship in carnality and not caring for the word. And why did he say that? He wasn't saying, I'd rather that you be destined to hell. He was saying that it's easier for an unbeliever to simply believe in Christ, and when they do, they automatically become hot. Remember, they're immediately filled with God the Holy Spirit. So they're automatically hot. So he would rather them be an unbeliever because it's easier. Once you get lukewarm, it's harder to get out of it. It takes a lot of time, and it takes a lot of struggle with your own preconceived notions. And you might have to sit home in your bed and think about things and say, which is right, which is wrong. I was taught this way, now this is being taught this way. And you have to struggle with it in your mind. And that's fine. You shouldn't accept anything right off the bat. You, you need to think about it because you need, to be, you need to be settled in your own conscience, especially so that you know that you are doing the right thing in your own mind. And you might be wrong, but... Uh, at least you've thought about it. That's objectivity. Objectivity thinks about things. Subjectivity reacts to things. So what you do is you go home and say, this guy said this, it's in conflict with what I learned. Then you uh, think about it. And you might keep going back and more scripture will be revealed to you until finally you say, it lines up with all the scripture he's given me, so it must be correct. And we all have to go through what is called thought testing. And usually we go through that starting out in our Christian way of life or if we've gotten sucked away and uh, come back to it. And we have to go through what is called thought testing. And we have to, and we try to reconcile what we've learned in the past with what we're hearing now. But if it's the truth, there's no reconciliation. Either one's right or one's wrong. There's no in between. One's right and one's wrong. And you have to make the choice on your own. Then in 11.13, for all the prophets and the law prophesied until John appeared. And what this means, uh, extension. this is an extension from verse 12. Remember, there were no verses in the original languages. We inserted them for our benefit so that we could find our place very quickly. So this verse is still an extension of verse 12. And what it's saying is simply this. 
Even in the Old Testament scriptures, grace was declared. John the Baptist came declaring grace. And those who are least in the kingdom of heaven, those who are grace-oriented, will be rewarded and become great in the kingdom of heaven. And even the prophets and the law prophesied these things, is what it's saying. In other words, they even, it was even prophesied of, uh, concerning grace in the Old Testament. And even though there was a law in the Old Testament, there's still grace. 11.14, and if you will receive it, this means... Uh, He's about to say something that's going to shock them again, but he's making it clear. He's saying, if you believe it, if you receive it, he is Elijah. John the baptizer is Elijah, who is prophesied to come. And if you will receive it, he is Elijah, who is prophesied to come. It was prophesied in Isaiah. And since Elijah, you see, Elijah is also the herald for the second advent of Christ. We'll study this in Revelation when we get to it many years from now. Since Elijah is the herald for Christ's second advent, if they will accept Christ then at the second advent, John would, or if they would have accepted Christ right then during the uh, time that our Lord was on the earth, John would in effect be the Elijah to come. And that has to do, you have to, when you go over Matthew, you have to know dispensations in detail. And what our Lord is saying is, if you had received my message, if you had received John the Baptist's message, then he would have been the herald of the second advent and we would have moved straight into the millennium. That's what he's saying. But because they rejected it, they're not going to move straight into the millennium. They're going to move straight into the fifth cycle of discipline. And as it says in Romans, because of the Jews' rejection of the gospel, we have the church age. So greater grace is given to us. So even the wrath of man praises God. So the fact that even the Jews had a wrath against uh, God and against uh, Jesus Christ, even though that occurred, well, a dispensation of greater grace emerged called the church age and that's where we live in the church age in which we've been given far above and beyond what they've ever had in the past what they ever had during the time of the hypostatic union and what they will ever have in the tribulation or in the millennium so what he was saying is look he would have been the Elijah who was to come if you would have accepted it because he was heralding the second advent as if it were about to occur and it was until they rejected it. But grace comes before judgment, so it had to be offered before the fifth cycle could come. So this is why he offered it to the Jews first, and then when they rejected it, he offered it to the Gentiles, because grace comes before judgment. But since the vast majority did not accept the message of John, nor did they accept the message of Christ, the herald of the 1,000-year reign of Christ, the herald of the millennium, is postponed due to negative volition, that is due to, people not re due to people rejecting Christ and his message. For that reason, it's been postponed to a later date, and we don't know when it'll be. If the, rapture, if the resurrection were to occur in five minutes from now, then we know that the millennium will occur seven years from now. And then we're, there's a thousand more years of human history. So when you go to school and they teach you that uh, because we pollute the air with our cars that the earth is going to end. Don't believe that nonsense. That's satanic. That's not true whatsoever. They're trying to get you to support socialism, trying to get you to regulate business and do all of those things that are anti-establishment. Don't believe that. Now, don't argue with them when they say it. Just don't believe it. And when you have a test and they say, and they have told you in the past, the worst thing that's ever happened is the automobile, as they might have a tendency to do, especially in other parts of the country. And they give you a test and say, what's the worst thing? Write automobile and get a good grade. And you're not, uh, you're not compromising your principles. You're just getting a good grade and following authority. But don't believe it. You can think what you want. and Just don't believe it. Now, my, I myself would have a hard time writing down automobile. I probably would write down you, you dumb ass. No, sorry. <laughs> I'd probably write down you, you idiot. 
And uh, that just slips out. I need to clean up uh, a little bit in my own conversations. So, uh, that's embarrassing. So, continuing. And if you receive it, he is the Elijah who is prophesied to come. Whoever has ears, listen. Now, we'll close with this point because it's a good one. He's saying, look, you've had your eyes on John the baptizer this whole time. And you have ears, why didn't you listen? Whoever has ears, listen. Whoever has ears, listen to the fact that, yes, uh, you, you're always uh, contemplating, is he a prophet or not? Why not just listen to the message? If you have ears, listen to the message. The title is not important. The message is. And who and what I am up here teaching is not important. My personality is not important, whether it be obnoxious or friendly. What's important is the message that comes from my mouth. And I guarantee you, when I stand up here, I'm filled with God, the Holy Spirit, and I'm making as sure as possible that I'm giving to you everything correctly. So focus on the message, not the man. If you were to focus on the man, I wouldn't blame you for walking out. But don't focus on the man, focus on the message. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word. May we come to understand that it's the Word of God that's important, that it's not personalities. But if we are learning the Word of God, then we are going to fulfill our protocol spiritual life. We are going to glorify God, which is going to be our only destiny on this earth. So may we come to have that personal destiny through our daily perception, metabolization, and application of your word. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.